Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. It's a real pleasure to be welcoming uh, you to this uh, uh, next CSF series. My name's Maya Butch from the University of Manchester, and um, today we will be focusing on the second in a series of updates on the clinical management of JAK inhibitors uh, in inflammatory arthritis, with a particular focus on implementing uh, regulatory updates. I'm just trying to progress my slides, so do bear with me for a moment. So, thank you. So, um, in addition, uh, we've got a great faculty. Uh, those of you that uh, joined the first uh, webinar will remember. So, joined by Chris Edwards uh, from Southampton in the UK, uh, Anya Strangfeld from the Charité uh, University Berlin, who's also co-founder of the Rabbit Registry, and also uh, Lorenzo Dagner from uh, Rheumatology Allergy Rare Disease at San Rafael Milano. So we've got a great faculty and some uh, great expertise and insights really to contribute to this session. Next slide, please. So just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, you'll all be on mute for the duration of the meeting. Please do contribute to questions. Uh, it's what makes really this uh, webinar so productive uh, and enjoyable. So questions to uh, the speaker and to the panel can be submitted at any time throughout the course of this webinar through the Q&A function. And if you do have any questions or queries or you're having any difficulties, please use the chat box as you can see on, on the bottom right uh, and you can be alerted and, and, and guided through any technical difficulties. So this is the format for today's meeting. Uh, we'll be kicking off shortly with Anya, who's going to give us a background on the long-term safety data and the FDA labeling for JAK inhibitors in rheumatoid arthritis. And then that will be supplemented and consolidated by Chris Edwards, who will talk on the European track review uh, of JAK inhibitor data. Um, we'll then have Lorenzo, sorry, there's just an omission there. We'll have to, Lorenzo who will speak to the uh, clinical impact of these uh, regulatory updates in terms of our day-to-day -day management, so the relevance and the impact this has on our decision-making with our patients in real life. And then we'll wrap up with a good time for discussion. I think it will um, actually lead to a whole load of um, pertinent questions uh, in, that reflect the complexities on how we interpret regulatory updates in the real world. So I'm not going to delay any further. It's a real pleasure to introduce Anya, who's going to be talking on the long-term safety data and FDA labeling. Anya, over to you. Thank you very much, Maya. And um, I also welcome everybody at the at the screen very heartily. And I say good afternoon. It's good afternoon in... Uh, <laughs> here late afternoon in Germany. My part in this webinar, as you already heard, is long-term safety data and also some spots on the FDA labeling on JAK inhibitor safety in RA. And these are my disclosures. And I want to start um, with randomized controlled trials and long-term extension studies and the and analysis of the data that comes from then. I also want to show you some real world evidence, and then I want to come to the FDA labeling. The first study I want to show you is an integrated safety summary of 19 completed RCTs and um, long one, no, two long-term extension studies. They included data up to 2017 with a maximum exposure of nine and a half years of tofacitinib and more than 7,000 RA patients were included overall. The authors looked at several outcomes. One of it is serious infections, and you can see the incidence rate with 2.5 and 2.3 without herpes zoster is somewhat that what we expect from also from BDMA-treated patients. 
And the uh, most frequent events were pneumonia, herpes zoster, urinary tract infection, and cellulitis. And this is also that what we see in our registers um, regarding biologic treatments. And um, you can see here rates in different time exposures. And something I want to point out looking at that graph is that we should not see it as a time um, as a long-term exposure or as a time uh, variant, but we should always keep in mind that serious infection rates that are shown here are only true for this period they are indicated in because the number of patients we have at the beginning is not the same as the number of patients we have, for example, after five years. So after three years, only 50% of the patients that were looked at at the beginning are still um, in the analysis. But nevertheless, what I really like in this study is that uh, risk factors for um, serious infections were looked at in great detail. For example, the authors found out that um, a risk factor for serious infections is the lymphocyte cell count, lymphopenia, and um, that if patients have a cell count of less than 500, they have a threefold increased um, incidence of serious infections compared to patients that have a normal cell count, lymphocyte cell count of above 1,500. Other risk factors that were shown to, to play a role is a higher tofacitinib dose and also a higher, um, a lower physical function measured with the HAC-DI. And this is something we also see in our registers. And um, glucocorticoid use was also a risk factor for serious infections as were comorbidities like higher BMI, diabetes, and COPD, all risk factors that we also see in other treatments. Herpes zoster was also investigated with those authors and um, in, in the data, and you see with an incidence rate of 3.6 that this is nearly a threefold increased free, um, incidence compared to the rates we see in BDMA treated patients of around usually 0.8 or 0.9 per 100 patient years. And what is, um, but this could be, and this is the class effect of the JAK inhibitors. And what is similar to um, other, to other um, investigations is that we have around 10% of the patients with a herpes zoster that have a complicated herpes zoster course. Other events that were looked at were malignancies, non-melanoma skin cancer, venous thromboembolism, and adjudicated maze, major um, cardiovascular events. And all the rates that we see here, 0.8 0 for malignancies, 0 0.6 for non-melanoma skin cancer, 0 0.3 for venous thromboembolism, and 0 0.4 for um, maize are similar to that rate that we see in BDMA treated patients. So the conclusion of the authors is that the rates of safety events were generally similar to those reported for BDMA except for herpes zoster. The limitation of a type of this of, of this type of study is that there are no direct comparators within the design. So um, the next one is that patients included in randomized controlled trials are strictly selected and are not, um, not every time uh, representative for the patient population we see in the um, in the practice or in real world. Then we have to we have to um, also think about that the studies were were performed in different times in different time periods. They also have different durations, and we have to deal with drug survival bias. All those limitations are also true for this study, the next one I want to point out, which uh, now looked at baricitinib, another drug inhibitor. Here, 10 studies were included, nine RCTs and one LTE trial. And um, 
Also, again, with a maximum exposure of 9.3 years, median was four and a half years. And what you can see here with rates are the same or are very similar to those rates that I just had uh, shown you. Serious infections, incidence rate of 2.6, purpose zoster 3.0, maize 0 0.5 and all the other ones that I don't have to read to you, but they are um, they are really similar to the rates that we have just seen. And um, what was different in this study, that there was also an um, investigation of the dosages, like um, do patients with a four milligram dosage of paracetinib, do they have more serious adverse events? And there was no dose difference. 80% of those patients studied had an exposure of 4 milligram baricitinib. And when you look at those, um, those rates, there is no statistically um, significant difference. So as I said, the same limitations as in the other study are also true in this study. Another investigation of baricitinib safety, cardiovascular safety, um, looked at the RA begin, RA beam study, and also um, extra the placebo controlled phase of those study. And what was intriguing was that in this um, placebo controlled arm at the first um, 24 weeks, there was um, there was an imbalance of the DVT PE occurrence. Um, which was not seen anymore if all the data analysis was then integrated in the set. But if we look at this placebo arm, then there um, was maybe a signal which was not seen after the switch to, to um, the comparator. So... When we look at this FDA uh, labeling and warnings afterwards, we first have the question, why did these warnings occur? Because the first warnings already came in 2012, and then there were a series of warnings that I will show you. And when we now look at the data, which is not so different from the data that we expect from biologic demat treated patients, then uh, we have to go back to the randomized controlled trials at the early phases or at the early studies of the drug inhibitors. And here there were um, signals mainly in the tofacitinib um, dosage group of 10 milligram twice daily, which is not the one that we use for the treatment of RA. But here VTEs had a... Um, had a yeah, the venous thrombotic events um, had a signal, and that was why, and also um, some, some other events occurred. So that was why the FDA um, urged Pfizer to do another safety study, the oral surveying study, which we were talking about um, in detail in the last webinar. And here also um, a statistically significant hazard ratio occurred in the 10 milligram dosing group, but no statistically significant in the five milligram tofacitinib group. So also some other events in the baricitinib and placebo controlled studies um, looking or, or um, showing a VTE imbalance occurred. And um, then the numerical higher risk for maize, which was non-significant in the oral surveillance and the significantly higher risk for malignancies in the oral surveillance, prompted um, the FDA and the EMA to select patients for to, to say to um, all physicians and rheumatologists to select patients for the entire JAK inhibitor class cautiously. In contrast, we have we have multiple systematic reviews that showed no increase of VTEs and maize, and we have also some real-world evidence. And this is what I want to show you now. Um, real-world evidence stemming from claims data and observational studies, registries, and in this analysis, looking at baricitinib um, compared to TNF inhibitors, um, these are... Um, this is a French study 
both um, data sources were combined. Three registries and 11 claims data sets were included in this study. And you can see um, venous thrombotic event rates of one with a hazard ratio of 1.5, which is statistically significant from the TNF inhibitor um, risk. So for VTE, there was a significantly increased risk with baricitinib which means in absolute um, numbers, if you treat 1,000 patients with baricitinib instead of TNF inhibitors, you will find three additional VTEs. So the number needed to harm is around 333. Also MACE, major cardiovascular events and serious infections were analyzed in this study. And as you can see here, there was a numerically increased, but no significantly increased risk found in this study. The limitation of this study was that there was a short duration of exposure with a mean of nine months under baricitinib treatment, which is not so much um, regarding our long-term treatment that we need for our patients. This is another French study um, with claims data, and they have a um, quite uh, innovative design, I have to say, because they used the patients as their own controls. They had the um, JAK inhibitor prescription period, but they had also the pre-exposure period. They had the post-exposure period, short-term 30 days and long-term up to 60 days after stopping a treatment. And what they found out, they were looking at venous thrombotic events and arterial thromboembolic events. And what they found was that compared to the pre-exposure period, there was a higher um, incidence in the, in the, during the exposure period which was then in the post-exposure period um, going down again. The same for the arterial thromboembolic events, also here a higher rate, but not um, a higher rate in the exposure period, which was then getting again lower in the post-exposure period. But I have to say none of those increases or decreases was statistically significant. Another French study from claims data um, showed that there was an increased incidence of major cardiovascular events and venous thrombotic events in the JAK inhibitor treated patients compared to other limumab treated patients, which was not significant this difference in the maze, but was significant um, regarding the venous thrombotic events. In the venous thrombotic events, we can see in the baricitinib treated patients that there was a disproportional um, rate in the pulmonary embolisms, which was much higher in the um, baricitinib treated group pulmonary embolisms um, regarding to venous thrombotic events, also compared to the other treatments. But adjusted for several variables and patient characteristics, the COX model showed that there is no significant increase for either of those events um, Yeah, for JAK inhibitors um, in comparison to TNF inhibitors. The authors performed a lot of subgroup analysis also in older patients. And what was expected was shown that in older patients, the incidence rates increased, but there was no um, significance between JAK inhibitor treatment and um, TNF uh, and adalimumab. So the risk did not differ. Another, um, this was also shown in another analysis from the US, the from the Coevitas register. Here are venous thrombotic events, the incidence rates in um, patients treated with tofacitinib. Um, compared with patients treated with any um, kind of biologic. And here the rates were in all um, events that were looked at similar and no difference. This is in contrast to a Swedish study. And they found that um, during JAK inhibitor treatment, the rates 
of um, venous thrombotic events were significantly higher than in all the other biologics except for interleukin-6. Here, it did not reach statistical significance, but for um, compared to all the other um, treatments. They also found that 50% uh, higher rates in form from VTEs in males than in females and a nine times higher risk in patients with prior venous thrombotic events. This Kaplan-Meier curve shows first the general population rate and the events occurring there. And you see you have a, a lower risk in the general population for VTEs than in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. These are patients with RA treated with BDMATs, any kind of BDMATs, and these are the patients treated with JAK inhibitors. And you can see here more events occurring in a shorter time. The overall rate of VTEs in patients treated with JAK inhibitors was therefore significantly increased compared to TNF inhibitors, but this increase was mainly due to pulmonary um, embolisms. And this add to the concern regarding cardiovascular safety of drug inhibitors, but the authors also say this must be weighed against the risk of inadequate and inadequate treatment of disease activity. Um, a study that I also introduced last time is the STAR-RA study. Three claims databases from the U US were investigated and um, MACE was, was investigated in this analysis, the occurrence of major cardiovascular events. And you see in the non-selected population cohort, there was no um, significant difference. There was also no significant difference in a uh, higher risk population, but you see that the estimates get more to um, that tofacitinib might increase the risk of um, further major cardiovascular events, especially when patients had a previous um, cardiovascular event, which is shown here that um, patients and not in patients that did not have any cardiovascular event. Um, here we can see the estimate that is um, even in, in a beneficial area um, for tofacitinib treatment. So coming to the FDA labeling for drug inhibitors, we had a lot of um, drug safety communications from the FDA starting in 2012, and the last ones were in 2000, in, in 20, uh, 2000, yeah, uh, in 2021, and um, and in in the one from September 2021, um, they. They addressed um, serious heart-related events, risk of serious infections, cancer, blood clots, and death for drug inhibitors. And this should be addressed in product labeling. They required new and updated warnings. And now for other arthritis medicines, um, in addition to Xelians, which already had a warning, they also now said that for baricitinib and ubatacitinib, olumiant and rinvog, um, that they also should add this warning in their, in their product labeling because they said there are no studies of, of this um, of these substances, but they share mechanisms of action with xelians. And so the FDA considers that these medicines may have the similar risks as seen in the Xelian safety trial, and they meant the oral surveillance study. So MACE was added as a new box warning in December 2021, and revisions were made for mortality, malignancies, and thrombosis. And what was also added was a prescribing restriction, which is not in place in, in Europe, but uh, required from the FDA. For RA patients, patients with psoriatic arthritis and patients with juvenile idiopathic arthritis, um, there's an update required um, that drug, inhibit drug inhibitors should only prescribe after one or more TNF blockers, after they had failed or if there's an intolerance to it. So and this um, time arrow shows you 
some differences between FDA warnings and um, European uh, circumstances, which we will hear from in the talk from um, Chris Edwards in short. And um, this was that in 2012, tofacitinib was approved in, in the, from the FDA in the US, but not in Europe. But on the other hand, baricitinib was approved in Europe at the same time as um, tofacitinib in 2017. But in Europe, there was an approval of four milligram dosing, which was not in the US. Filgotinib was approved in 2020, which was not approved in the US. And these are the box warnings and the warnings from the FDA. And you can see the first one was in 2012 for serious infections and malignancies. The next one in 2019 for mortality and thrombosis. Then they required an updated box warning. And in 2021, all drug inhibitors were included and the prescribing restrictions that drug inhibitors should only be prescribed after TNF inhibitor failure was also added. So this is my last slide, my summary there. Um, the labeling and warnings of the FDA are different from the EMA. And we still have very conflicting results on VTE, maze, malignancies, and um, under treatment and exposure with drug inhibitors. And most of the real world data does not show significantly increased risk, but we don't know if this is already because um, patients are stratified of the rheumatologist before they get the treatment. And this is why we need especially more granular data to um, be able to individualize our treatment because we still want to, our aim is still to um, the best and adequate disease control. And thank you. Thank you, Anya. That was brilliant. Really nice uh, run through all, all the data, the breadth of data we have, um, and then the FDA labeling. So that leads us nicely on to uh, the next slide. Sorry, the next talk by Chris Edwards, who's going to take us through the European Track Review. Chris, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to follow Anya. Um, it's great to see that summary of all the data, and I really like seeing the timeline, which allows us to see difference. And, and I'll come back to the theme of uh, differences between different regulatory authorities and, and what that might tell us about the decisions that made and are made and the human element, how we interpret the information that we see. So I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the background to risk and benefit uh, with JAK inhibitors. I'm going to talk about the PRAC review and the results of that and where that is in the further process uh, processes of the EMA. Uh, and then try and link that to how uh, around the world some of the uh, recommendations and guidelines are being altered as a result of this information, which also highlights maybe different ways of producing recommendations and guidelines as well, whether they're done on a, a three yearly basis, which has tended to happen for rheumatoid in Europe, uh, or whether they're living guidelines like the Australian and perhaps the Canadian as well. OK, so here are my disclosures. OK, so this slide is just to highlight a couple of things, really. I, I suppose the first is to say what we're talking about uh, and these changes in regulatory advice from different parts of the world are examples of pharmacovigilance occurring in real time. It, it's what should happen. We, uh, we launch drugs, we start to use drugs, uh, and then data comes in and we start to reanalyze information. We get real world data. Uh, studies get mandated like oral surveillance by the FDA uh, and then more data comes along and we have to make up our mind how we use these things, how we apply the medications in real world. The other thing which I've alluded to already is that there are sometimes differences between different parts of the world and, and that doesn't mean things are absolutely right or wrong. It means there's an element of interpretation and I think where there is, it means there is a bit of uncertainty and people are trying to decide on the basis probably of exactly the same data, probably being looked at in a very similar way, but maybe in slightly different healthcare settings and different legal settings, how to make the best judgments about future use. And then it is left to us to try and decide clinically what we advise our patients uh, and, and what we might do. Okay, so this is the risk benefit bit. And, and I think it's always worth saying we're, we're not just thinking about risk. Uh, uh, and we're going to talk about risk a little bit more in a moment. Uh, and Anya has beautifully shown uh, some of the risk data. But this is just to remind ourselves 
uh, that there's also lots of efficacy data around the use of JAK inhibitors from famous studies like strategy, oral strategy, RA beam, select compare, and the Finch studies, looking at head-to-head -head studies against the TNF inhibitor adalimumab. And the statistics, depending on how it was organized and how it was done, showing at least non-inferiority and for some endpoint superiority as well. And I think it's really important that that isn't lost in the discussions that we're having, that there is a benefit also to the risk. Oral surveillance has been mentioned. I don't want to spend ages uh, talking about this because you've seen lots of this already and Anya's mentioned this as well. Uh, just a couple of things I think to pull out. One is just to think about the fact that if we're trying to risk stratify patients to have JAK inhibitors or not, the greatest risk associated with using JAK inhibitors, certainly in oral surveillance and for tofacitinib, was age greater than 65 years and smoking. And that accounted for a lot of the risk uh, that was seen. And if we think about how we might stratify as we come to see how recommendations play out their, their advice, um, then perhaps we can use simpler methods of stratifying than using complicated cardiovascular uh, stratification systems that our cardiology colleagues might use. The other thing to think about is that, of course, this study is it's a relative risk, isn't it? It's, it's a risk looking at tofacitinib against an anti-TNF, uh, depending on whether people were in the US or within Europe. Uh, and Anya has mentioned, mentioned numbers needed to harm for uh, one of the other studies she's shown. Uh, but it's always interesting to look at what this means in terms of numbers, numbers needed to harm, numbers needed to treat if we were looking at efficacy. Uh, and you can see the data here. So, for example, um, with tofacitamide compared to TNF over a five year period, one additional mace required an extra 113 individuals or for cancers, an additional 55 individuals over that time uh, to be treated. So that's that's not to diminish the risk. It's just to put it in context. OK, so let's come back to the, the main part uh, of the talk, which is to think about what is PRAC? Uh, what was the PRAC recommendation uh, and what does it change? Uh, and this is really all about weighing risk. It's about risk benefit and deciding how much risk we take for an individual patient versus how bad their disease is and how important it is to pursue the sort of strategies and principles that we usually use when treating inflammatory disease like treat to target. And I think it's probably interesting um, to just take a, a little bit of time thinking about the process of coming up with these sorts of recommendations in regulatory agencies and, uh, and what uh, the advice consists of. So here's a slide taken off the EMA website, uh, and this looks at the PRAC process. So what's PRAC? It's Pharmacovigilance Risk Assessment Committee. And they're charged with uh, being asked to look at reviews of particular therapies and they carry it out in a particular way. So if you look at the slide, you can work from left across to right. Uh, they pull information when they're doing a review from various different databases. So that's the, the hard data of pharmacovigilance databases, the scientific literature. But then there's a very human element, uh, element uh, excuse me. There are, are patients involved, there are healthcare professionals, uh, and other academic and researchers, and then industry has an involvement uh, as well in this. And all of that is reviewed and it's all considered, and that leads to a recommendation. So what was the PRAC review around JAK inhibitors? We see on the left-hand side, this is the cartoon on what they did. So the different groups involved uh, with advice being sought from extra expert groups of rheumatologists, dermatologists, gastroenterologists, and patient representatives as well. And they looked at the data, much of which has already been described. Uh, and they came up with a few uh, recommendations as a result of this. So they confirmed uh, the tofacitinib uh, association with increased risk of, of MACE, of cancer and VTE that was seen in the oral surveillance study when compared to TNF inhibitor. And once again, that relative to TNF inhibitor bit, I think is really important. And the other thing that they thought is that they would conclude that these uh, safety fines would apply to all the jack inhibs, uh, jack inhibs being used uh, to treat chronic inflammatory diseases as well. So if we look a little bit more at the detail of that and the things they suggested uh, that should be done to reduce the risk 
of side effects associated with JAK inhibitor use. They also talked about restricting therapies in patients at risk if no suitable alternative, so this is slightly different language to the FDA, so rather than use a TNF inhibitor first, this is if no suitable alternative uh, is available, uh, and particularly take into account these risks, 65 years or above, increased risk of major cardiovascular problems, smokers and those with increased risk of cancer. And then the last point there is also uh, to keep in mind those with increased risk for blood clots for uh, VTE events. Okay, so that then feeds into a broader process and you can see the timeline at this. So there's the, the PRAC review, the procedure starts, it's under evaluation and the PRAC makes its reg recommendation. Then it goes to the Committee for Medicinal Products for Human Use, CHMP, and they've ratified uh, that recommendation from PRAC. And then there's a process of sign off before labels are changed on drugs. Uh, one thing that I think when I read uh, the PRAC uh, uh, initially uh, that we'll come to in the moment is, is a little think about uh, doses, uh, which uh, I've put in here as this extra box. So further, the doses should be reduced in patient groups at possible risk. So th this idea has been added in as it's gone to CHMP around thinking about using the lowest dose possible. And I think that's interesting in the discussion of what doses are, are allowed in different parts of the world and what the S FDA says versus what the EMA has said up until now. Okay, now this is some slides that are not based on science. This is me thinking, well, how would you interpret this? And what are the sorts of things you might say? And I haven't put all of the possibilities. So imagine you have a patient with rheumatoid arthritis as a result of this, and they fail their CSD miles. What do you do next? And would you do different things? Here's a low risk group of patients on the left hand side. If you had high risk groups of patients in terms of the risk of MACE or thromboembolism and malignancy, and where would you use things? Uh, and there is this difference between FDA and EMA as well, where FDA is saying use a TNF inhibitor first, uh, and then the EMA and then uh, the ULAR recommendations are more about if, you've, if you don't have alternatives and if you consider the risk, uh, then you might use JAK inhibitors or biological therapies. Uh, and we'll come to the sort of detail of that. And, and it's interesting when you look through the medical profess and, uh, press and how they start to interpret these things in slightly different ways. So we'll come back to discussing that. So what about how those sorts of uh, readouts from PRAC, from CHMP start to influence guidelines? Well, the most recent EULA recommendations uh, were already in process when uh, the PRAC process was, was going on. Um, here's a, a couple of uh, bits of information on the left-hand side. This is the 2019 EULAR recommendations, and this is recommendation eight. And this was the recommendation, the year of the recommendation, which uh, considered biological DMARDs and TSD mods, so JAK inhibitors, to be equivalent. And they were put in the same place. And then you can see this adjustment. And being in the room at the time of the discussion, there was really interesting discussions with some people feeling we should say that everybody should use a TNF inhibitor first before a JAK inhibitor, those that wanted greater flexibility. There were uh, clinical voices, there were patient voices in this. And this was the wording that then was uh, ultimately agreed on. If the treatment target is not achieved with the first CSD mod strategy, when poor prognostic factors are present, a biological DMARD should be added. JAK inhibitors may be considered, but pertinent risk factors must be taken uh, into account. So let's walk our way through the ULAR recommendations, which you'll know well. And I think there are a few points uh, worth making as we go through. So we start off with the bit you will know about. Usually it's methotrexate, maybe another CSD mod, and we try to achieve a target of at least low disease activity. But if we fail and someone has poor prognostic factors, and I think when we're considering risk benefit, this is worth thinking about because the people that are going to get a biological therapy or a JAK inhibitor are selected out on the basis that they are likely to do badly because they're seropositive, they have high levels of disease activity, and they failed uh, other CSD mods, for example. And you can see that the, the new recommendations say add a biological DMOD, consider JAK inhibitor use, but only after you've done the risk assessment. And then that plays through to if you fail the first level of advanced therapies into thinking about the next biologic uh, or JAK inhibitor. I thought I'd just zoom in on the, the risk factors that are mentioned. Uh, uh, and once again, it's just highlighting this over 65 
smoking, cardiovascular risk, malignancy risk, previous malignancy, thromboembolic disease in the past. Okay, now if we're thinking about uh, regulatory authorities and how they influence recommendations, it's quite interesting to think about different ways that recommendations are produced around the world. Um, so the ULAR recommendations have usually been reproduced every three years or so when there's enough data to warrant a change. The Australian recommendations currently are a living recommendation which use some uh, different software and it's interesting just to have a look at it but it gives the opportunity to modify this quite quickly if you get changes uh, from regulatory authorities. So here's a sort of standard old-fashioned paper reference to one of the things they looked at so this was was tapering and you can see the authors there and Rachel Bookbinder in Monash uh, has, has run this program uh, along with the uh, Australian uh, Rheumatology Society. So here's taken off the website. So they use uh, an app called the Magic App. Uh, and actually, if you had this live, you'd be able to look at the bottom row and you could press on evidence to decision and the rationale and practical information. And people have an opportunity to feedback. But you can see on the right hand side, it says new. And, th and this is looking at the use of uh, biological therapies, uh, or, or JAK inhibitors uh, when people have failed their first TNF inhibitor, for example. And very quickly, they were able to modify this, this version, which was republished on the 14th of December uh, last year, to add, add that last bit in, which is in particular, JAK inhibitors may not be preferred in those who are at high risk of cardiovascular disease or cancer. Okay, so that's me done. So I think we talked a little bit about pharmacovigilance and how this is the process as it's meant to happen. We're meant to find information and we're meant to then weigh it up. Uh, so I see that you know, as a positive thing that we're working our way through this. We've talked about the PRAC and EMA process, which hopefully adds on to the information we've had about the FDA uh, and where that is. And to start to try and think about how does that influence what we do and how do we weigh that against the efficacy benefits? Uh, and, and, and make that personalised to each individual's. And then a little bit about how that might alter recommendations and guidelines uh, around the world and how perhaps you know, living guidelines just out of it allows you to make those changes so quickly as illustrated by the Australian guidelines. Uh, and finally, just to say that the fact that there's difference around the world gives us this opportunity to ask why uh, and to use those questions and answers to really inform how we treat patients. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Uh, great, again, and I think reviewing and highlighting the differences in the recommendations is really instructive, as you say. So finally, to the last speaker, Lorenzo, pleasure to uh, introduce you today to give this last uh, talk that's really going to pull it together in a sense uh, and give clinical pertinence in terms of implementing regulatory updates. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you very much, Maya, for your introduction. And uh, I will be discussing with you some, some concepts and idea to how implement in real world and in real life those regulatory updates. And this job is really made, has been made more easy by the two wonderful presentation that preceded me. So I say if we can go on. Perfect. So as you every one of you know, there are two major key principles of rheumatoid arthritis treatment, and they are the tight disease control and then the consequent treat to target. That is a kind of derivation of the first concept. And as you perfectly know, the tight control has been formalized uh, back in 2004. And uh, with a very safe, let's say, groundbreaking but simple study that showed that if we, the, the patient randomized from intensive versus routine care, assessed by monthly by an objective system of measuring disease activity, when there were track of having a significant disease activity, there was an escalation of the treatment itself. And then, then those patients were evaluated independently every three months by an independent assessor. And as you all know, patients that were treated with a tight control of the disease did better in terms of all the, the, the descriptors that was considered, including eula response, transmission, and the different ACR 20, 15, and 70. And as you can see here, the disease activity was significantly lower in patients receiving an intensive evaluation. Um, the treat to target concept came a little bit later. This paper is from 2010, and actually uh, formalized the way in which we should work to obtain the tight control of the disease. And indeed, the, the, the task force suggested to have 
that to establish a target of disease activity for each patient, which should be remission in some specific patient. Although this is activity could be also accepted, but again, patients should be treated and re-evaluated at least every three months, ideally every month, and the disease and the treatment should be escalated when we do not reach the specific target. And hoping and uh, aiming to put the patient in a status of sustained remission or sustained lower disease activity is that was a specific target. And according to that, a lot of recommendations have been developed, including the EULA recommendation. This is the very last one that has been already cited by my colleagues before. And as you know, and as you remember, uh, this, this, those principles are perfectly applied. And also a specific position came there after the studies, the, the, the um, oral surveillance studies and the data that emerged on baricitinib with a specific sentence saying that when you want to treat a patient after a conventional synthetic bd marks with a JAK inhibitor, then you should be considering a number of risk factors, namely age, as history of current or past smoking, cardiovascular risk factor, risk for malignancy and for thromboembolic events. And the wording is significant because it's slightly different from what actually it came out from the prax CMP opinion in which actually the wording is slightly different and he said that JAK inhibitor should be used only if no other suitable treatment are available in the same group of patients. And this is somehow a little bit the, something that should, we should be keeping in our mind. And indeed, before the PRAC guidelines, I would say we know that JAK inhibitors are extremely effective drug and they have a significant efficacy and a significant um, effectiveness in real world. And they were widely used after the first CD, synthet conventional synthetic BDMAT failure, but also after BDMAT failure and also after a failure of another targeted synthetic DMART. There was a specific interest in monotherapy because clearly these are JAK inhibitors, it's just the other class together with interleukin-6 inhibitors that are approved to be used in monotherapy. Some specific subject has a specific interest because they may be benefiting for the usage of this drug also because they have some specific comorbidity that could respond to JAK inhibitors or some specific subject may be preferring to take an oral drug instead of having an injective drug for a number of reasons. And there was a significant attention just in patient with a history of VTE. After the PRAC determination, probably the attitude of physician prescribing those class of drug has changed. And indeed, there was a significant reduction of the use of those drugs after conventional synthetic drug mild failure as first line drug, probably also a slight decrease after first BDMARC failure and also after targeted synthetic BDMARC failure. Clearly, the driver for monotherapy and the attention for monotherapy is an, still an important driver. And so it maybe move a little bit uh, earlier in the list of the prescribed prescription drug for those patients. And the attention is widened to a, a largest number of patients as um, my colleague pointed out perfectly before. Uh, clearly this was driven by an idea. First, we don't want to harm our patient. And this is the, clearly the principle that guide every physician in making a decision. But I honestly speaking with a number of physicians involved in the treatment of patient rheumatoid arthritis, probably a little bit, there's also an addition to this sentence from Hippocrates, but is, uh, this is my translation into Latin, which means first do not harm yourself, dear doctor. So think also of yourself. And indeed uh, this worry about JAK inhibitors that, that came out from the regulatory information, whatever, started a number of behavior that is in some instances are a little bit strange. For example, I know of some physician that actually started with a quite a defensive attitude, namely using, for example, an informed consent from the patient. Clearly, every decision about the drug treatment should be a shared the decision between the patient and the, and the physician and the caring physician, but it's completely useless to actually ask for a patient if he, has, he or she has no risk factors to sign an informed consent just because there's uh, some, some data in a specific population, if not worrying the patient. And also, I mean, if you discuss with the patient and write down that the reason for which you decide to, to pick up a JAK inhibitor, even in the presence of, uh, of other um, at attention or contraindication is something that should be objectively motivated even without the consent. You need to discuss with the patient clearly, but it's not needed to have a written consent. The second point that to me is something that we have to think of is that the risk for that is to adhere less to tight control and treat to target. Uh, since we, we know that these drugs are effective and may be extremely effective in some specific subtype of patient, delaying that, maybe placing a patient at risk uh, 
for problems connecting now to a perfect control of the disease. And there are a lot of evidence. These are quite old data showing, for example, that if you start later uh, an effective treatment for, for, um, for rheumatoid arthritis, we have a lower chance of get putting the patient in remission versus if we start early. And uh, we perfectly know that as soon as an effective intervention occur, we are not only able to stop inflammation in this patient, but we are also stop the, the progression to reduction and loss of function of the specific patient. So an early effective inter intervention as soon as possible is the one of the major determinants of prevention of long-term disability. And also we do know, and this is again an old study, that one of the major correlates uh, for probability of survival in rheumatoid arthritis patient is the level of disease activity independently from the type of drug that we use for control the disease activity itself. And patient having a minimal disease activity is roughly half of the risk of dying than patient that have a severe disease activity a long time of follow-up. And uh, we know that, and also not only this is activity, but for example, as is shown in the lower part of the graph, the number of active joints in the joint count here, or the, the limitation of activity of daily living that is here, correlates with, this, with mortality. And also in the same way that uh, for coronary artery disease or Hodgkin disease, there's a correlation with the different stages of the disease. Another more even risky, fact that can happen is that if we, even if we don't have a perfect control of disease activity with the drug, with the DMAR, we add some non-DMAR drug that may be impacting on mortality and also on cardiovascular mortality, for example. And I give you an example. It's quite well known that the use of cortisone, of prednisone, increases the risk of mortality in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And we perfectly know that, for example, patients that are treated with methotrexate have a uh, reduction, a protection, and it's here you can see here, a protection toward mortality if they receive methotrexate. But if they receive prednisone and methotrexate, prednisone is able to abolish this advantage in mortality that is given by methotrexate. And if they've received just prednisone, this is again something that will be increasing the mortality. And the same concept could be extended, for example, to another drug such as sulfasalazine. Uh, we, this is even more clear in this study that actually compared a population of rheumatoid arthritis patient having diabetes mellitus or not having diabetes mellitus treated or not with glucocorticoids. And as you can see in this table, we know that giving patients uh, glucocorticoid if they have uh, diabetes mellitus independently of whatever they are taking and on the, their disease activity increases significantly the risk of death for all caused by three times roughly and by 2.3 times the specific cardiovascular mortality. And these data are even more evident in the population that has not diabetes mellitus in the background since there's a reduced by baseline uh, cardiovascular mortality. And as you can see here, the risk is 4.37 and 3.29. And this is statistically significant. We know that adding a... Um, a, uh, and say that a non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drug to rheumatoid arthritis is not varying the risk of cardiovascular mortality. And there's no sign that addition of NSAIDs to treatment increases cardiovascular mortality. But this is true in all patients and in general. If we consider, for example, patients that have some specific cardiac conditions, such chronic heart failure, you can see here that the adding of a significant, a different uh, um, NSAIDs, a therapeutic dose, will be increasing mortality and increasing significantly, not just uh, uh, by some standard deviation as shown by JAK inhibitors, for example. And the same thing is even worse if we consider patients that have are taking anti-inflammatory drug after they have a myocardial infarction or if they have an history of ischemic cardio, uh, cardiac disease. And you can see here the differences are significantly, statistically significantly different from the, from the, the patients that are not receiving the treatment. And if we go back to the same graph that my colleague shared with you before, we remember that there was a signal, a clear signal that we should be taking in consideration. I'm not saying that we should be giving JAK inhibitors to the specific population, but again, take in your mind how significant was the risk for corticosteroids and for NSAIDs in patients having a background cardiovascular disease as compared to what we see in both the oral surveillance study and the SARA study. 
So what we shall we do practically when we have this information coming from the scientific literature and from also the position from the, 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 the regulatory agency? I would say that probably we should be putting together, clearly taking in strong consideration the indication that the regulatory uh, authorities are giving us, but merge them with a good dose of clinical common sense like the one that, for example, has been expressed by the expert of Euler when they formulate the guidelines saying that we should be taking in consideration those specific aspects, as we did every day, I would say, for every drug. If, you do, if we administer a drug to a patient, we should be thinking of all the potential risk and benefit of the drug. Indeed, we know that JAK inhibitors show the efficacy and effectiveness in conventional synthetic DMARD and BDMARD failure. The response is quick and maintained over time, and in many instances, this could preventing us from the use of corticosteroids as bridging therapy. They, are effic effic uh, they have a significant efficacy and persistence even in monotherapy. Also, I would say that clearly acting from the prudent side, the, 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 the PRAC and the CHMP prefer to have to give a kind of regulation that apply to all JAK inhibitors. But we also know that different JAK inhibitors may have different specificity due to their, their, their different inhibition profile of specific cytokines. And so and it, the drug ideally could be different. So this is something that should be studied and not taken like, I mean, uh, without criticism. And since this is true, it's at least thinkable that the efficacy and safety profile may be different individual patients. Clearly, we need to go for specific and generic guidelines. We do not go at that level for the single patient. But again, when we have to make a decision on the single patient, we should be taking in consideration this. And clearly enough, the ongoing safety recommendations are useful, but are pushing us again to a greater cons um, consciousness for having a personalized, agreed choice on the drug that we're giving to the patient, discussing with the patient the potential risks and benefit, and do not just sticking, trying to defend ourselves to the risk of giving something that may be somehow artful, when in some instances we do not treat, not treating a significantly active disease may be even more harmful for the patient. And also we should be considering the evolving clinical knowledge of and data on JAK inhibitors. And let me say that I'm, I'm provoking you a little bit with the study. The study was published in 2013 in the American Journal of Medicine. And actually it shows the differences in terms of side effects and specifically, uh, this, as you can see in the top for the composite cardiovascular outcome of a class of drug that I've covered here against uh, TNF inhibitors. And as you can see here, the favor in terms of cardiovascular, composite cardiovascular outcome is statistically significant. So a more strong signal that what has been seen in the oral surveillance studies favoring TNF inhibitors. And then this class of drug are non-biologic drug DMARDs and most of the patients were on methotrexate in the study, as you can see here. And uh, again, this is something that is not forcing us not to use methotrexate, but is forcing us to understand that if we stick on methotrexate or another um, conventional and synthetic DMARD, probably we will be not controlling the disease. And if we don't control the disease, again, we have this problem that is shown here perfectly in this graph. So if you have a patient with a severe uh, disease activity, he has a doubled risk of dying for whatever cause than a patient with minimal or uh, in, who is in remission. And the same concept is depicted is in the graph that shows you that if we treat to target our patient and versus we go for usual care, the patients that are in usual care are an incidence of fatal and fatal events uh, that is definitely and statistically greater to patients that are treated to target. So we have to put together the guidelines with the data about disease activity. And probably, I, 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 when I conclude my talk now, uh, by taking out one of the graphs that I show you provocally uh, last time, depicting how the clinician in general over time may be, uh, may, may be modifying their attitude toward the drug or JAK inhibitors in specific. At the very beginning, we have a kind of intermediate perception of the drug. Then data came out and we think that we can treat everyone and everybody with this drug. Then some side effects came out and the general opinion is thinking that that specific drug is a poison, but probably the truth is between those two extremes that are extreme. So the drug may be useful if we give this drug to the right patient at the right time and at the right dose, keeping in mind that we have to control the disease as the first mission to preserve function and to also reduce mortality and morbidity in our patient. And I thank you for your attention. That's brilliant. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, really raised lots of uh, relevant clinical issues and it 
really takes us nicely on to uh, the discussion. Um, we'll bring the rest of the panelists as well um, to take part in, in this session. We have a question or two coming through. I'd really encourage all of you attending, there's many of you, I'm sure there's um, questions you'd like to ask, so please don't hesitate um, to put your questions down in the Q&A. So we'll kick off with, um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this to you first, Chris, if that's okay. So um, the phrase, unless no suitable alternative um, treatment is available, what does that mean? Um, does it mean a jack inhibitor should be an absolute last resort in at-risk patients? Or is it placing the decision into that shared decision-making process? So there's lots of concepts in that, but it's a fundamental question. Yeah, and I, th I think it's always really interesting how people read these things differently. One of the things I was trying to allude to, those little cartoons I drew drawn, is trying to bring out some of the differences in the, the reporting in the medical rep press, because some of the reporting says exactly the more ex extreme version of how you interpret this, that it means try every single thing first, try every single biological agent. Now, that, that's personally not how I interpret that. I think it's about deciding what's alternative um, in a particular individual. So for a particular individual, maybe they tried a different drug. Maybe they don't want a particular drug. Maybe they have a particular risk factor that's a concern, like a high risk of TB. Maybe yeah. they absolutely don't want to take injections because they properly are needle phobic. Now, that's not loads of people, but as an example. So to me, I interpret it as being an ability to be a little bit flexible and to say, let's weigh it up with the individual. There's a very nice phrase in, in, in an article I, I've, I read uh, yesterday, which is about this is about getting to treat to not just treat to target, but treat to agreement. It's about getting the agreement yeah. of, of, of the patient to consider what's an alternative for them. Um, so anyway, that's how I would interpret it. But I quite like it where things can be interpreted in different ways. I think that's that, that shows we need to think about it rather than being prescriptive and saying, just do this. Uh, and that's the nature of medicine. That that does bring the art into it. It's, it's always uh, paraphrases. And Lorenzo, you really spoke to this as well, because I suppose what Chris was highlighting is that it's not necessarily looking through the lens of jack inhibitors and cardiovascular risk, but also ascertaining risks of other therapies in the context of the individual patient that may have a range of comorbidities. Yeah, I, I mean, it could also be if you need a very effective treatment, then and then you could also say, OK, I need this effective treatment now. Sorry, Lorenzo, but, but I just. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Lorenzo, you spoke about glucocorticoids. Often we forget that in, even in the area of targeted therapies. Exactly, exactly. So the, the, uh, my, my personal feeling is that I agree completely uh, with what Chris said before and, uh, and about the fact that we need to use our mind, our uh, cleverness to find out the exact treatment, the perfect treatment for the patient, discussing with the patient with uh, some specific request. The, a, a patient being completely afraid of needles, some of them are there, and then you risk to prescribe something that is injective and then the patient is not using that or the, necess the necessity of using methotrexate on background, which is another problem. And we know that many of the data that have been generated are generated with methotrexate plus. So I'm not saying that we use, should be forcing the decision and not taking in consideration the guidelines, which are important. But again, we need to work and think which is the best strategy for those patients. Yeah. Maybe if a patient has, a, uh, let's say, a rheumatoid arthritis that is slightly, I mean, it's not perfectly controlled, but uh, by, by the first line conventional synthetic, then clearly uh, there will be a number of different options. But for example, a patient with a significantly active disease that yeah. is intolerant to metrotrexate or other conventional synthetic, I mean, clearly we should be moving according to, yeah. to other guidelines to an interleukin-6 inhibitor or to a JAK inhibitor. And so we should be weighting the two things together. So yeah. again, we need to use our mind, or our cleverness in order to pick up the right drug for the right patient or the right yeah. drug. Yeah, and we may come on to patient perspectives. So I mean, Chris spoke about the shared decision as well. We'll come on to that in a moment. I'm just seeing a, a raft of questions coming through, which is good to see. So um, this, this question, it's an interesting one. So based on... The data that we have, um, and this is to you, Anya and Chris, based on the data that are clearly highlighted or suggested, age, smoking, etc., relevant, 
then for the future of clinical trials, how, where should that go? Should we be, I mean, that's maybe a question to industry and I'm sure there's industry attendees here, but uh, should uh, trials be excluding these patients? What are your thoughts? Oh, no, I, I don't think that we should exclude too many patients from the RCTs because then the representativity gets less and less for our patient population that we treat in in uh, yeah in real world. Oh, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, well, I think the same. I mean, I'm always really interested in um, seeing trials that show the complete population and, and the over 65 age group is often exactly as you say underrepresented and the over 75 even less and sometimes excluded it's why it's really nice when you see some of the real world data which often includes some of the older patient groups uh, within it so at that level i'd really encourage more of people over 65 not less the flip side of that though and i think it's an interesting ethical question if you were sitting with an ethics committee and you were saying okay so the regulatory authorities say you really shouldn't give imagine it's a trial where it's a first advanced therapy and they say you shouldn't give it the regulators say use something else first and you're putting people in a trial which is against the regulatory guidance i th i think that's still an interesting discussion though isn't it i think that's why it's such an interesting mm -hmm. question you could argue that you need to collect data in this group and therefore it's vital but the flip side of that is if it's going against what's being said by the regulatory authority that you'd, you'd have to think that through wouldn't you so I, if I, it's I, for a known drug with yeah. risks yeah. that's a different scenario and if it's evaluating emergent or repurposed or other drugs it's a different question as yeah, well then you can definitely use them yeah then no concern because as no you concern. said the reality is we need real life pharmacovigilance uh, that, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. the data has shown dose reduction so there's a specific i forgot to mention that should should trials be anticipating the need for dose reduction or starting with lower dose i suppose in in high risk populations so that's not just relevant for cardiovascular risk but do you think maybe trials need to be um, cognizant of that? Any thoughts? I mean, it's a, it depends on the individual drug. It's a bit tricky to answer specifically, but I think it very much depends on individual drug. And I think it's only when data emerge, actually, do we sometimes know. It's no different to TNF inhibitors and biologics. We've learned about these drugs with increasing um, exposure and experience. So I think that the dose reduction, there's always benefits of it, and particularly in the era of sometimes wanting to dose taper, but also now we're increasingly seeing this paradigm maybe that in high risk patients could potentially afford to use a lower dose strategy. And I think that maybe that's where the question is. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I, think, and I think it's definitely interesting to get more information. D does it mean that a, a drug that has two doses has an advantage over one that doesn't? Yeah. I, I'm not sure I entirely read yeah. The guidance says that it says where there's a lower dose, consider using it. However, you know, flexibility has its uses, doesn't it? And, and I think mm. maybe in long term extension studies, as has ha happened to some of the jack inhibitors, certainly to baricitin, if it's happened, isn't it? In the long term extension, having a step yeah. down arm. I think that's interesting. You often end up with a small group. So it's perhaps hard to collect robust statistically robust data. But you get yeah. a you get an idea, you get a flavor of, of, of the step down in that. Agreed, agreed. We'll come on to this other question and I was going to pick it up, um, Chris, after a comment you made and then I'll, I'll come to Lorenzo as well. So do you advocate Q-risk-3 or other cardiovascular risk scores in our patients and use a cutoff? And I was interested that you mentioned these are complicated and because age and smoking particularly have been identified, perhaps we should be adopting simplified approaches to risk stratify. But there's a known unknown a little bit and these risk factors are validating validated but clearly identifying those at risk and yeah so, and one one good thing that's come out of if you can call it a good thing is out of all surveillance in the stages the importance of addressing multiple risk factors to improve the overall outcomes of our patients so yeah yeah so I, so i'm not i wouldn't be i'm not speaking against using a, yeah. a, a, a comp a I'm using the word complex. I'm being negative immediately, but using a, <laughs> a complex cardiovascular risk yeah. score straight away. It's just, I was trying to imagine. So out, in a trial setting, definitely. If I'm trying to answer a specific thing, I may well use it. But imagine I'm seeing a patient. So I do a cardiovascular risk score. Then I do a malignancy risk score. Yeah. Then maybe there's a DVT PE risk score. Uh, and already it's the next day, you know, so 
it's thinking about how you do some weighting. And in fact, there are some nice publications out now where people try to weight it in a slightly simpler way where they just say, you know, has a cardiovascular risk factor or has a previous malignancy or has is over 65 or not. Yeah. And, and you end up with something that just gives you a steer towards what's yeah. reasonable. Yeah. So, you know, it's not complete science, but it but it, it makes you think these these subjects are important. And that's the thing I just think is a bit more difficult with doing all the yeah. all these specific scores. The risk is it becomes black and white. Lorenzo, your thoughts? Yeah, I perfectly agree with that. With that. One of the points also is that the Rosalvenia study put together different risk factor uh, and you have one, two, three or more or whatever. I mean, pharmacologically controlled hypertension would be a risk factor weighted in the study as much as uh, and previous uh, myocardial infarction. And probably we need to explore a little bit uh, and the star array study, for example, gave some insights to us to that uh, about which single risk factor may be responsible more more significantly for the increased risk in that population. Honestly, I discussed with a number of cardiologists about the, the idea of considering as a significantly increased risk a person that has uh, borderline hypertension receiving one drug and is now perfectly controlled. Uh, again, I'm not thinking that this personally and many cardiologists will be thinking the same, that this is actually a risk factor for a cardiovascular disease. I mean, it is, it's a slight risk factor. Again, if we have on the other side the risk of not controlling enough the disease, I'm quite convinced and think everyone around this table is convinced that not having a perfect disease control would be a strongly more significant risk factor for cardiovascular disease in those patients. Yeah, yeah. They're coming in thick and fast now. So I'm, I'm going to have to pick and choose a little bit. So one that's very clinically relevant, I suppose, a patient who's already established on the JAK inhibitor uh, who then develops a major adverse cardiovascular event. Um, what should be the next step in terms of that RA therapy, the Jack and Gimter therapy? Anyone like to offer? I'm, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think even in that scenario, there's no absolute, um, and it very much depends on, and I think Lorenzo, you alluded to this as well, but it depends on the individual patient profile, what treatment options are available, if any, um, what treatments have been used, other comorbidities, the importance of controlling disease activity, the risk of losing that if the JAK inhibitor is taken away, particularly if there aren't any others. And Lorenzo, your point about glucocorticoids, we often, in the, in the pre-biologic era, we used to then accept glucocorticoids. And it, it, feels, it feels difficult to do that in this era, to, to condemn someone to glucocorticoids. And the ability for us to very clearly say, that the relative risk between these, and I'll bring Anya in in a moment, the relative risk of, of one strategy over another, we don't have those kinds of data. So it's a judgment call. It comes back to the art. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that, absolutely. And uh, again, I think that personalization, as we all are agreeing around this table again, is the key for deciding the best treatment for each patient. And uh, uh, you should be studying all the characteristics that you've included, including also maybe the length and duration of rheumatoid arthritis, uh, which are clearly the alternatives and which are the risk of not controlling the disease versus the potential risk of adding something. Clearly, among those risk factors, the only one that I that seems very I mean, at least quite significantly influencing the outcome is the history of a previous myocardial infarction event. So with that specific patient, honestly, I would be a little bit more worried and clearly a history of an active or a recent cancer as for many other biological, but this opens another discussion of, of what to do on those specific patients. But still, uh, I think, again, we can discuss with our patient. I have patients that have an oncological story and they, they, they tell me, us, okay, I may have an increased risk of cancer, but I don't want to live with this pain. So please do something. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge the risk of the fact that those, those treatments, whatever they are, they may be giving yeah. me a slightly increased risk of cancer, but I don't cope with this pain and all these troubles yeah. and all this anymore. So it's something that, again, makes forces us to go back to our work of physician of being doctor and yeah. working and discussing with the patient and obtaining again uh, an, a treat to agreement an agreed decision of which which yeah. treatment we should be doing doing understanding the risk yeah. and potential of the treatment yeah and Anya maybe I could just come to you in terms of when it comes to interpreting data we're making sometimes value judgments here when we talk a bit of the art but how it is about 
There are data that we don't know. We only know for now in comparison of JAK inhibitor TNF, that they're the data that are, that are being used to inform our guidance and our practice. Um, but speaking to all, all these points that we've been making, clinical practice, then going back to the data you showed where there's conflicting data uh, and how to manage that in terms of how do you as an epidemiologist assess um, other drugs and potential risk in the context of JAK inhibitor when the direct comparisons aren't made? Mm, I, I mean, we have a, a big um, advantage with our register because we have a lot of drugs included in the same design of study. So we can so we can look at all these drugs. So we could also stratify, for example, patients that are that have a higher cardiovascular risk and then look at uh, different drugs that are then prescribed. But uh, we have the limitation that it's observational data and that the decision yeah. of the rheumatologist um, will drive a little bit um, which which drug is prescribed. So, and yeah. the other thing is that if you are if you have a patient population that has a higher risk, I mean the relative risk is um, yeah. higher than if you have a patient population where you do, so so it's sometimes in the patient population where you don't have a lot of risk. Oh, now the others are gone. Right. Yeah. That's three of us still. <laughs> and um, and um, then even a little risk increase is not, yeah. doesn't count, but yeah. but in a higher risk population, Absolutely. a little risk increase. Um, and that's a really a lot. concept, yeah. yeah. There, there are a few questions, I'm just mindful of time, there are a few questions yeah. <laughs> that we can tackle together um, in one go. So questions such as if they're 64-year-olds and going on a JAK inhibitor or... Um, if if a patient is already treated with Jack, we address that. But but Chris, it goes back to it's not meant to be prescriptive. So we have to still these. There's a lot of uh, question coming through. It. How do we manage patients if they're 64, want to go on a Jack and hit to one year, and they smoke? Um, and so this is again coming back to that judgment that you were talking about and looking more broadly. Is that anything you want to add or? It's yeah, so I, I, yeah, no, I, I'm, very, I'm very happy. I don't know how much my signal might be breaking up at the moment. Oh, okay. <laughs> but but but, assu but assuming you can you can still hear me, you can you can you yes. can stop me if it start to break up. Um, I, I I think what I what I really wouldn't want is 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 these sorts of things to end up with clinical craziness. And by that I mean we have people and they're one day before their 65th fifth birthday and we have them on a drug and okay. they hit their birthday and we change it. So I think you have to be a bit flexible about this. Instinctively, I don't want to suddenly change things. It's not that I'm ignoring the risk, but but it makes me think back to the COVID where there was a temptation for people and clinicians to stop all the immunosuppressants yeah. until we knew what happened. And that would have caused chaos. Yeah. And so largely we advised that you don't do that. And that turned out to be OK. That turned yeah. out probably to be the right way to just be a bit steady about things. I think we do more harm if we start to take people off things rapidly. Yeah. I just think the next time you see the patient, it needs the discussion, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's absolutely that's the crucial thing. There's a question that says, Yep. shouldn't be consenting our patients and I thought well we already do informal consent with our patients so exactly that Chris if that patient comes next time we feel obliged to inform them and update them of data yeah and but I, but but there are some situations so Lorenzo picked out one you know if someone has a big myocardial infarction and they're unstable yeah. I'm going to be a bit concerned about that. Yeah. You know, that, that's likely to end up with the drug being stopped and consideration yeah. for another drug. But just becoming 65 or or smoking a little bit more or becoming hypertensive on treatment, that none of those things are probably going to result in yeah. me changing. Yeah. In isolation. It's risk factors in isolation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And what I really liked was that Lorenzo also showed us the risk for glucocorticoids and NSIR. Absolutely. And if we if we have older patients and then we stop effective treatment and then we treat them with glucocorticoids, I think this is uh, more harm than, than benefit. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a question specifically for Lorenzo um, that uh, tight control treated targets, obviously extremely important. That's what the guidelines advocate, but the guidelines also fundamentally speak to starting with methotrexate uh, and using 
advanced therapies in the in CSD mild failure. So often there's already accrued a level of ongoing inflammation disease burden. Do you do you find a conflict in that, or how how, would, how do you see that in the context of treat target and what you were talking about in terms of the importance of that to reduce and minimize cardiovascular risk? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that I mean guidelines are not the uh, let's say table of flow, <laughs> so it's something that is evolving over time. As as soon as new concept came out, and uh, as soon as new data came out, they should be evolving. Uh, at this stage, uh, uh, there's a consensus that every patient should be treated also from an economical point of view, I would say, with uh, conventional synthetic demand at first line. And the future will be changing depending on the data. There are data on, uh, on JAK inhibitors that you all perfectly know, suggest that some of them are better than methotrexate as a first line treatment. Yeah. Uh, and then, I mean, we should be taking in consideration also this. There are a number of other evaluations. There are some local restriction that force physician to have even maybe a second DMART before yeah. emotional DMART before going to bio. So yeah. there are a lot of factors. But the point is that again, guide the guidelines as it's happening because they are changing every other year more or less, need to evolve with the scientific knowledge on the subject and with the scientific data that should be gathered. So I, yeah. I perfectly agree with, with what is proposed and also yeah. with the wording, it is extremely clever because it's suggesting that you should be taking in consideration and as, as I said, as we typically should be doing whatever, when we prescribe an antibiotic to our patient or decide to wait, when we prescribe some uh, anti-inflammatory drug for pain or whatever, we make a decision and we weigh the risks and benefits. And I think this is just a clear point by yeah. point description of the fact, and then we should be making the decision. So a couple of questions over monotherapy that can we use what we've learned from oral surveillance in the context of JAK inhibitor monotherapy use? Well, in, in, in oral surveillance, there was methotrexate in both groups, I think. I think that's right, isn't it? So and it where JAK inhibitors are used as, I think they're asking, uh, where JAK inhibitors are used as monotherapy. Yeah, but can and we do take those risk factors? Or... Is it still relevant? Yeah, well, so, so t well, I think oral surveillance doesn't give us the information, does it? And it's harder to know. I mean, it, it, and I guess it depends how much of an effect you think methotrexate has on reducing yeah. cardiovascular events. Now, yeah. I think it probably does. So, and it's likely to have, whether you use that with a TNF inhibitor or whether you use that with a JAK inhibitor, yeah. the methotrexate is probably going to be beneficial in that setting, isn't it? So I, I'm not sure it tells us complete. I'm not sure it, it changes what I do. I don't know what the others think. Yeah, nearly the same. I, I was wondering, I um, was there a subgroup analysis of the methotrexate dosages in, in yeah, the different arms? <laughs> yeah, I'd really like to see that, Anya. I think that's a great idea. I mean, I would certainly suggest, Chris, that from what you're saying, like you said, there may be some additional protective effects. So if anything, one isn't going to underestimate uh, risk through JAK and him to monotherapy, because if, one, if, one, if you're implying that methotrexate may have a Athoprotective effects, which mm -hmm. data certainly show, then the concern with JAK inhibitor monotherapy would be that there's a, and, and, and this is just for the audience, that there is no basis for this, but that the theoretical concern is that there'd be an even higher risk because there's no uh, additional protective effects that is, is perhaps balancing out. I don't know. So you can't extrapolate from all surveillance, but still employ the same sort of caution, I think is what we're all saying. Yeah, I agree. There's a methodology question, Anya. I'm going to come to you. <laughs> um, so it goes back to the non-inferiority design and the hazard ratio 1.8 and how it was chosen for all surveillance um, to look at cardiovascular risk reduction. So um, what do you think that that was applied in the OS study and that a statistical evaluation method methodology used to assess CV risk reduction of what, what is traditionally done for anti uh, oral anti-diabetic therapy is then applied here. So is that appropriate? And then applying mm -hmm. it to malignancy as well, is that appropriate? Oh, I, I, I think I can't answer this uh, really good because I think this, um, how this non-inferiority level, this upper margin is chosen, it's, it's a bit, I don't know if there's a real calculation um, how you can choose it. So because at the beginning, you don't know so much about your treatment and you can you can 
take other randomized controlled trials into account and then maybe um, also transport some information that you have from other studies and then you say okay this um, is my is my upper margin for the non-inferiority level but um, I don't think that it is really based on a um, stable statistical method so <laughs> that's helpful yes it's a tricky one isn't it so um, we've got time maybe for one maybe two questions so patient in remission uh, for some time after addition of JAK inhibitor to methotrexate, so they're on combination JAK inhibitor, would you consider tapering methotrexate of the JAK inhibitor? It's an in it's an interesting question. So I don't know whether it's saying, I was expecting maybe to say, would you consider tapering the JAK inhibitor if there are any concerns, but thoughts on that either way around, tapering with JAK inhibitor combination? But if, if, may, if we're considering a 65-year-old person, I honestly uh, am in perfectly in line with what the colleagues have already said, namely the fact that the, this cutoff age from 64 and 364 days to being 65 is not something so quantic that makes me... But to take a drug, <laughs> if a patient is in remission, is... Uh, you honestly, that? I will be discussing again with this patient. We have an yes. advantage to, due to the fact that we know that jack inhibition, if we stop the drug you have and the patient is getting worse, then you will probably in a short time seeing again the, the re, re emergence of symptoms and of the disease activity. So yes. I would be probably considering mm, tapering down and taking out the, 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 the jack inhibitor and uh, re-evaluating the patient for clinical activity. Honestly, if the patient, again, has uh, experienced a, a flare-up of the disease, I will be discussing with her or him uh, about the, the reintroduction of the JAK inhibitor or the idea strategy. Mm -hmm. Having another information, the patient is over 65, perfect, but we have an historical data that the patient was in remission with a JAK. So I would be strongly, I have an element for strongly considering the class of drug in this patient again. Yeah. And I think there'd be a difference perhaps in Europe versus the US. Yeah. The ACR would tend to say, well, look, you needed to add in the advanced therapy. So yeah. why would you take the advanced therapy away? Because yeah. it worked, take away the methotrexate. I think in a European setting, certainly in a UK setting, we've tended to take away the advanced therapy and leave the methotrexate. Yeah. Um, but then one of the things Lorenzo said, I think it's really interesting, the half life of the drugs make a real difference, don't they? So when you stop uh, or if you're tapering a TNF inhibitor, depending on what it is, it might stay in the system for weeks, wow. months. And so you get a very soft landing potentially. You think there's no problem. And then six months later, the person <laughs> flares when they're not in clinic. If you stop the JAK inhibitor within a week or two, you know. Yeah. It works or it doesn't. Now, yeah. I'm not saying one is better or worse. They're just different because the pharmacokinetics yeah. and dynamics are different. You can get a very clear indication with Jack tapering very quickly, whether it's going yeah. to be suitable or not. I think that's an interesting answer and got a question and answer to, to, to close on. So um, just leaves me really to thank the faculty for brilliant talks. Um, uh, we've really had a good review, comprehensive review of the data and the literature from Anya and Chris also taking us through the guidelines, recommendations and track evaluation and then Lorenzo nicely capturing I think those patient relevant factors when we have the patient in front of us. I thank you all for your attention and for the great questions. It's been um, really much, that much more fun having uh, good questions uh, uh, to generate this kind of discussion. Um, do please fill in the short evaluation form um, to let us know your feedback. It's really important because we obviously CSF and the initiative strive to enhance these uh, educational meetings. And remember, the live stream version of this webinar is now available. So even the first one, if anyone missed that, and also today's as well. So you can see that on the YouTube channel as shown here. So thanks very much again. Take care, everyone.